first television event. The President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, His Excellency President Bola Ahmed Tinubu Gisefar. Your Excellency's governors here present. Let me welcome very specially the members of the Federal Executive Council that are here. All the ministers that are here, I welcome you. Members of the National Assembly here are present. Let me welcome the chairman of the Nigerian Economic Summit Group, Mr. Lani Yusuf, the vice chairman of NSG, and other board members of the NSG that are here present. I'd like to respectfully welcome past chairman of NSG. Let me welcome all the CEOs of companies in organized private sector of Nigeria, members of the diplomatic corps, development partners, heads of civil society organizations, invited guests, ladies and gentlemen. Your Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, it is a pleasure that I welcome all of you to the 29th Nigeria Economic Summit, a summit that has in the last 28 editions brought together global leaders in government, business, politics, development, civil society, and the academia to produce worthy economic roadmap for Nigeria. So on behalf of the Nigeria Economic Summit Group and the Federal Ministry of Budget and Economic Planning, I welcome you all. This year, the focus will be on how do we create the pathways to sustainable economic transformation and inclusion. Those that have discernment know that Nigeria is an emerging economic powerhouse by various measures. Yet, many who live here face persistent barriers to economic opportunity and wealth creation. The nation's continued progress depends not only on how much prosperity we generate, but also on who has access to that prosperity. So how do we use institutions, strategic investment in infrastructure, entrepreneurship and innovation to create an economy that is transformed and inclusive? That will engage us in the next two days. My name is Ebera Young, and I will not be alone in the next two days. Uh, working with me will be Timmy Badru and Oladile Opulano. So, Your Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, to, to welcome all of you to this conference is a man that is skilled in transformation. He is a change manager with over 20 years' experience of advising public sector organizations and private sector organizations on navigating strategic change. Please join us and welcome here, Mr. Olani Yusuf, Chairman of the Joint Economic Summit Group. Excellency, President Bola Ahmed Tinubu, GCFR, all other distinguished guests, let me stand on already established protocol. Your Excellencies, our partners, delegates, friends and members of the Nigerian Economic Summit Group, I warmly welcome you to the 29th Economic Summit convened under the theme, Pathways to Sustainable Economic Transformation and Inclusion. Our country has entered a new political and economic leadership and leadership era where the world is undergoing an unprecedented economic and geopolitical transformation. These are strategic national implications, challenges and opportunities that Nigeria must consider as we advance into the future. On the global stage, 
the first few years of this decade have witnessed very significant disruptions from the unprecedented COVID-19 pandemic to the ongoing war in Ukraine. And all these have ushered in fresh series of crises, including food, energy, and disruptions to the global supply chain. The transmission effects of this crisis have indeed aggravated economic challenges on the continent and also in Nigeria. For us in Nigeria, we have seen a return of older risk, including inflation, cost of living crisis, capital outflows, widespread social discontent, risk of geopolitically motivated regional confrontation, and recently, the marked risk of de-democratization of West Africa. These risk factors shaping this very uncertain and turbulent period will only favor a prepared, resilient, resourceful, responsive, and responsible national leadership. Earlier this year, we at the NESG engaged the country's political leadership when we hosted the first ever one-on-one -on -one close presidential dialogue session before the elections in March. And that session allowed our members, and indeed the citizens, to hear directly from the three presidential candidates. Mr. President, thank you for keeping faith with us then, and also thank you for keeping faith with us today. You had promised back then that you will work with the NESG and you will be at our summit. So thank you for being here at the 29th successive economic summit. And this is the longest standing unbroken national public dialogue on the continent. In the last decade, the NESG has kept faith with the government and Nigerians in our four critical roles as a dialogue partner, a watchdog, connector, and intervener. Our co-creation with the public sector has led to crucial summit out outputs, some of which include the creation of the Presidential Enabling Business Environment Council, PEBEC, whose work saw Nigeria improve in the ease of doing business rankings. Our work also includes the setting up of the Office of the Chief Trade Negotiator, whose work the NESG community actively supported in the country's final signing and ratification of the African Continental Free Trade Area. Our work in the past decade has also included, included the creation of the National Assembly Enabling Business Roundtable, what we call NASBA, which is a joint collaboration between the NESG, the National Assembly, and the Nigerian Business and Bar Association. And the work of NASBA has led to the passage of landmark legislations including the Company and Allied Matters Act 2020, the Petroleum Industry Act, the Seed, Fertilizer, and Plant Varieties Act, amongst many others. As the stewardship of the seventh consecutive democratic transition of power passed on to this administration of renewed hope, Your Excellency, your administration's unveiling of the eight priorities of government, which focus on economic growth and job creation, ending poverty, access to capital, inclusivity, food security, national security, fairness and the rule of law, and of course, an anti-corruption stance, provides a strategic perspective of your government's grasp of both the issues and the solutions to the problems facing our nation. And of course, also of the need for the transformation of the Nigerian economy into one that is competitive, sustainable, inclusive, and open. But this will only be possible if both the public and private sector leaders work together towards the same national value and vision. Hence, this year's summit has been calibrated as a burning platform to answer the question of the essential pillars of economic transformation that will get us to the future envisaged by the government the need for urgent strategic shifts that impact the ease and the cost of doing business within a relatively short time is a matter of existential threat 
to the survival of enterprises and of entrepreneurs. The low access to and the increasing cost of FX, the high cost of inventory, of imported inputs and operations, coupled with the diversity of taxes, continue to erode business balance sheets with resultant contraction in production and in employment. Large firms are battling with low capacity utilization, while medium, small, and micro enterprises also grapple with multidimensional complexities. And of course, these poor economic outcomes have created worsening social conditions that cannot be taken for granted. With more than 100 million of us being multidimensionally poor, there are potentially more risks of stagnation and distress if a low growth and low investment era persists. The future of the Nigerian child is also at stake across every geopolitical zone. Also, the Nigerian aging population is equally at risk. There is a high prospect that a retiree savings and investments will be eroded entirely within just a few years into the first or second decade of retirement. Our high fertility rates, which is driving a very high population growth, higher than our economic growth, also poses a risk of an unproductive population bulge with an unmanageable social infrastructure cost and a huge burden for supporting our children's health, nutrition, and education. We know a multi-trillion dollar economy is viable within a decade of serious reforms, consistent economic action, and deliberate institutional reforms. Our nation stands at a critical precipice, and our challenges demand immediate concerted efforts. We need to act now with a shared sense of urgency. Your Excellency, a multi-trillion dollar economy growth trajectory will urgently require certain actions, including the following. One, a macroeconomic stabilization program supported by an aggressively scaled national security effort to halt all forms of syndicated and organized crime around crude oil and solid minerals. Two, a made in Nigeria agenda. To make in Nigeria, however, two strategic drivers must be put in place. First, it's a national emergency energization program to ensure easy access to stable, predictable, and affordable electricity supply. Second, is the creation of a national infrastructure corridor development program that will ensure an integrated linkage and logistic network that will link value chains to sea, land, and airports. Three is a national job creation plan that drives the creation of huge volume of high quality jobs. The fourth action we believe will be a revised national asset optimization plan that will ensure that critical national assets are fully utilized and are fully productive. If we must sell, concession, commercialize some of these assets to achieve the desired level of productivity, we should. Five, a national competitiveness plan that defines the sectors where we have a competitive advantage and export and passion targets to achieve a trade surplus and a positive balance of payment. Six, it's a capacity building plan that answers the type of skills, competencies, expertise, and technology know-how required for the Nigerian workforce for a digitally industrialized Nigeria. Seventh is a new compact with the Nigerian child that guarantees a promising, secure, and safe future for every Nigerian child. And lastly, eight, we need to revitalize national security policy and strategy to protect lives, properties, and our national assets. Achieving a multi-trillion dollar economy will require significant paradigm shift, big, bold actions, tough choices, and significant sacrifices by all of us. 
We are all living witnesses to the outcomes of delayed and deferred action. The NEHG stands ready to support the government to model the tough choices required and the associated palliative measures to ameliorate the short-term impact on the populace. In closing, I also would want to express my gratitude to our members, our private and public sector partners, and the international community for their dedication, participation, and belief in the realization of a stable, sustainable, secure, inclusive, and economically prosperous Nigeria. Our sincere gratitude at the NASG goes to the Honorable Minister of Budget and Economic Planning, who is our co-host of this summit. The Honorable Minister of Finance and the Coordinate Minister of the Economy and the Minister of Health and the Coordinate Minister of Social Welfare for their support in ensuring the 29th Nigerian Economic Summit became a reality. Our gratitude goes to all other Honorable Ministers and members of the Federal Executive Council, our National Assembly leadership, and Your Excellencies, all Executive State Governors, here present. On behalf of the NESG, it is my honor to say a big thank you to all of you for your support and to welcome you to the 29th Nigerian Economic Summit. May God bless Nigeria. God bless the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Your Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, good morning. My name is Temi Badru, and it's such an honor to be co-hosting the 29th edition of the Nigerian Economic Summit with the ever young, ever energetic Mr. Iberi Young. It's such an honor. He has a play on words. I mean, he's ever young, and his name is Mr. Iberi Young. <laughs> Your Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, as we say in our native language, Ekabo, Baka de Zua, Ndewo. Once again, you're welcome. <clears throat> Your Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, this summit is jointly organized by the NESG and the Federal Ministry of Budget and Economic Planning. And we just heard from the chairperson of the NSG. I also believe that it's quite important to hear from the Honorable Minister of budget and economic planning. So, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, your excellencies, please join me as I bring up Senator Abubakar Atiku Bagudu, C-O-N, for his welcome remarks. Good morning, your excellency, Mr. President, President. Bola Ahmed Tinubijisi, President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, and the Secretary to the Government of the Federation, Governor of Kwara State, and Chairman of the Nigerian Governors Forum, Deputy Governors that are here, our, our host, the Minister of State, FCT, my very dear brother and Coordinating Minister of the Economy, Olawole Edmund, the Attorney General of the Federation, and Minister of Debo. The chairman of NESG, Olani Yusuf, and indeed all the partners that are here. Distinguished invitees, stakeholders, ladies and gentlemen, good morning, everyone. I join the chairman of NESG in welcoming you to this summit. The summit, as you are aware, is an annual event organized by the Federal Ministry of Budget and Economic Planning on behalf of the federal government representing the public sector, working in partnership with the Nigerian Economic Summit Group. Since its inception, the Nigerian Economic Summit has provided a veritable platform to harness opinions from the public as well as the public sector, development partners, academia, and civil society organizations to find ways of working together to achieve faster economic growth. The working relationship between the public and private sector in organizing the annual summit has improved over the years such that it has become a model for public-private 
partnership in the country. The Nigerian Economic Summit Group is now a worthy partner of government, particularly in formulating policies for the overall development of Nigeria. And this is not surprising because our constitution and the fundamental objectives of state anticipate cooperation between private and public sector, in which was codified in the National Planning Act and mandated the mandate of the ministry, among others, includes consensus building together with the private sector in ensuring that both long-term, medium-term, and annual budget plans reflect the consensus of both the private and public sector. Equally, especially for us in the ministry, which is one of the, one of the ministries that have been recently reincorporated, courtesy of the institutionary alignment of President Asua Yubola Ahmed Sinibu's effort to align ministerial functions so that we generate more economic activity and growth. And as acknowledged by the chairman, Olani Yusuf, that today is an important day because it shows a president who kept, who keeps promises. He's, he's, he's being here today earlier than even scheduled. It's a promise kept because when we accompanied him to the interaction with the NESG in the presidential dialogue series in Lagos, he promised that it is not going to be a monologue, but dialogue. He promised that he was going to interact and hear all shades of opinion. And he has been doing that since he was sworn into office. So, Mr. President, we thank you. We commend you. I've been restricted to welcoming you here, Mr. President, because we don't want to preempt all, the, all that your speech will tell us because of the commendable efforts you have put in since you became uh, President of Nigeria. So I will skip that. However, I can still talk about the past before concluding. At the Presidential Dialogue Series, a lot has been said about the achievements in Lagos and similarities in the challenges of 1999 with our current challenges, low revenues, the um, international economic environment, similarly challenged, you know, and I don't want to say this, but it helps to focus then a Lagos state governor who was even challenged by the federal government. But yet, you are imaginative, you are bold, you are courageous. And I always say this, that in addition to all the big, bold initiatives that took place in Lagos, one commonly understated revolution that took place in Lagos was for many of us who lived in Lagos prior to 1999, there was a time when crossing the Apombon Bridge was a nightmare. Area boys would knock on vehicles, and even a pregnant woman would not be rescued by other motorists. Everyone would turn away his eyes. But you came and you saw the humanity in these people and make them members of the functional, functioning Lagos society. And today, among other challenges, the Nigeria is faced with that pressure for inclusion, which you have made a central point of your eight-point agenda, and I'm sure that we'll deliver on that. Thank you again, Mr. President. <clears throat> the topic chosen today, Mr. President, is holistic in its conception and reflect both the renewed hope agenda and the eight-point agenda. So I believe we will hear from you as what we have done so far. As you know, as all knows, the government have taken bold steps. In addition to that, Mr. President, we have commenced the process of mid-term review of the National Development Plan. The Coordinator Minister of the Economy have already secured approvals from you, 
and we have coordinated, we are coordinating the review and incorporation of the renewed hope agenda as well as the eight point agenda into the uh, eight priorities area of government, sorry, into the national development plan. We are faithfully committed to the implementation of plans, including the agenda 2050, because it is an irreducible minimum of commitment to some consensus by all, especially in a federal setup like Nigeria, which you have always believed, but which you have always led that should be recognized as such. We are a nation where in every financial year, at least 800 public budgets are presented, 774 in the different local governments, 36 budgets in the state, and uh, FCT, as well as the federal government. So there is an irreducible minimum of policy linkage and coordination that is required in order for this to deliver the promises that uh, Nigerians hope for. Particularly, again, these are plans and policies that every time the private sector at lower levels and higher levels of our corporate, uh, uh, corporate uh, oneness look at for direction or com for complementarity or for seriousness, therefore underscoring the need to ensure that the, at, at a minimum some irreducible consensus is reached. The excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, today's event has been structured to include plenary sessions, interactive panel, breakfast sessions, debate, as well as CEO roundtable. And in fact, in a very imaginative way, the medium-term expenditure framework which the Federal Executive, which you approved and the Federal Executive Council equally discussed, will be presented and discussed as part of this uh, uh, event. I believe that is an innovation. The key thrust of the various sessions will be to facilitate stakeholders' discussion on practical issues opportunities, policies, and strategies for guiding the sustainable transformation of our country. Your Excellency, I must not conclude without noting that your several engagements outside Nigeria and within Nigeria are quite noteworthy, and they truly represent that you are President who believes that the private sector will be given pride of place, domestic and international. Thank you very much for supporting us, and thank you very much for... Thank you very much, sir. The Honorable Minister of Budget and Economic Planning, Senator Abubakar Atiku Bagu, CON. Please be let's do another round of applause. Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, in the famous words of Helen Keller, alone we can do little, but together we can do so much more. When I think about the Nigerian Economic Summit, I think about a platform for synergy, a platform for collaboration, a platform that brings together stakeholders from the public and the private sector. And it's just beautiful to see government being represented here as well as the private sector. So maybe we can do one applause for the organizers, the NESG and the Federal Ministry of Budget and National Plan. Thank you. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, your excellencies, it's now time for a presentation on strategic options for pathways to sustainable economic transformation and inclusion. And to do this, I am honored to bring up to the stage the Vice Chairperson of the NESG. Your Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, please, let's give a resounding applause as I bring up Miss Amina Mena. A round of applause. Good morning, Your Excellency, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. I stand on existing protocol. 
As we have heard this morning from the chairman of the NASG and the Honorable Minister of Budget and Economic Planning, we are at a threshold in the life of our nation. We would be talking this morning about a nation which was once promising with high growth, but is now struggling with underdevelopment. Before I start to talk about the actual presentation, let me remind us that from the years 2010, we were seen all across the world as a nation which was a very high growing nation. Unfortunately, in time past, that growth has been eroded by inflation. We have witnessed two recessions in the last decades and a period of low growth despite experiencing an average growth of 7%. The NEST 29 summit themed the pathways to sustainable economic transformation and inclusion is a pivotal platform to bring together stakeholders to deliberate, to discuss, and to find ways forward and how we can move our country forward. The coming together to, co to present or deliberate has been done with stakeholders, not just from the private sector, but from public sector, from the diplomatic core, um, academia, civil societies. Our economy today stands at an economy of $450 billion. Our GDP, our growth rate, sorry, is at 3.1% and we have a per capita income of $1,863.20. The structure of our economy, the structure of our economy broken into three main parts constitutes agriculture at, 23, at 20, roughly 23%, services at 57.9%, industries at 19.8%. When we look at the economic structure, out of, my, out of the industry's percentage of 19.8, 9.4% of that is manufacturing. We have heard from the chairman of the NESG issues that affect the growth of this country, particularly with regards to security. We are aware that if we do not take deliberate steps to fix the security issues that we have today, our economy will continue to remain stagnated. But at the NESG, we believe that working together with government, an economy which is prosperous is possible again, and we can get there if we all work together. We see a nation where today, according to the NBS, We've got almost 100 million Nigerians living in poverty. That constitutes about 43% of our population. That 43% is significant. I mean, in the life of any nation, if you have 43% of your population living in poverty, then we do have a problem. And it's something that needs to be fixed urgently. We move to the next slide. Thank you. The graph we have on the screen depicts where we are as a nation, where we were also as a nation. You would recall that I did mention that we were a very um, high growing nation, but today I think the graph speaks for itself. We've gone from being a high benefit um, economic activity nation to one which is plowed by inflation and all the benefits of the economic activities which we should be, benef which we should be reaping somehow has eroded us. And we are really at a point where it's a conversation that must take place. We believe that the NESG together with government must come up with solutions. We must think outside the box to get our country back in the right trajectory. Needless to say that even if we speak and dream 
and talk about whatever it is that we want to do. Without a willing government at the center of the events, this will not be possible. Today, Mr. President, you sit at the helm of affairs as a willing reformer. And you sit at the helm of affairs as a willing reformer, sir. And we believe that our nation can get to a $4 trillion economy by the year 2035. As at the end of the year 2020, the Nigerian economy was a $450 billion economy. We have heard through the plans of the government, through their renewed hope agenda, how they plan to double their economy every four years to get to a $1 trillion economy. Additionally, if we go by the 2050 um, vision, the plan is to be at $3 trillion by the year 2035. But we do believe at the NESG that with the right pathways, which we will be reviewing today, we can actually get to $4 trillion. And of course, this is more so because we believe that we have a government now that we can dialogue with, that we can partner with, that we can speak to, and we can find solutions from the private sector, not just from a public sector point of view, but particularly from private sector, because we in this room are the people who feel the punch and are the face of the everyday Nigerians. When we do get to the year 2035 and we make our $4 trillion economy, we will have a nominal GDP of $4 trillion. Our growth rate will be at 13.5%. We will have a per capita um, income of $14,041. $14, the structure of the economy, which I reviewed earlier, but would now change, would now be skewed, where you would have agriculture at 16.7%. Services will constitute 50.2%, and industries will take 33.1%. Let me also state here that if we are able to keep to these numbers, we'll be taking 10 million Nigerians out of poverty every year. I will now mention a few pathways which we believe are easily achievable and working together with government, we are happy to distill further into this and work out a framework in details we already have a report which we will share with everyone, which will give you detailed analysis of what we have done and how we have arrived at these numbers. I took part in presidential dialogue with captains of industry at the Economic Summit House. That day, I made a promise to the Nigeria Economic Summit Group that I will be here today. I'm grateful to God Almighty that I'm able to keep that promise. I'm here. <laughs> to join you, this is 29th Nigeria Economic Summit theme. Summit, the theme, pathway to sustainable economic growth, economic transformation and inclusion. This is taking place at an auspicious moment in our nation's history, on which demand affords a great quantum of urgency and courage to implement much needed reforms. I agree. The five sub themes stimulating economic growth mobilizing finance for sustainable economic development, harnessing human capital, reforming public institutions, and promoting national cohesion and inclusion are consistent with my administration's renewable agenda. And we are confident that this summit will serve as a platform for translating our strategic vision into action and results with collaboration 
with you. After a decade dominated by two economic recessions and a global pandemic, we find ourselves coming into federal administration at a time that is laden with even more challenging social economic conditions than was the case in 1993, the year of the very first Nigerian Economic Summit. Combined global economic growth is projected not only to stagnate but slide into a reverse trajectory over the next year from 0.5 million percent growth recorded in 2022 down to 3.0 in 2023 and 2024. Yet, I contested for the high office of president because I believe in the future of this great nation. I believe that economic stabilization and growth are possible in the short to medium term, and that sustainable growth and inclusive economy, transformation is possible in the medium to long term. To this end, one week ago, the Federal Executive Council, under my chairmanship, approved the 24 to 20, 2024 to 2026 medium term expenditure framework a physical strategy pick. At that presidential dialogue, I committed to hitting the ground running, another promise I am happy to have kept. I had the ground running. Anchored on my firm belief that the fate and destiny have a place in the touch of human progress in our hands. We have set about establishing a government underpinned by our enshrined administrative principles of impartiality and government, impartiality and government according to constitution and the rule of law. Defending the nation from terror and all, all forms of criminality that threaten peace and stability of our country and subregion. Remodeling our economy for growth and development through job creation, food security, and ending extreme poverty. Prominence of women and youth in our government was a promise. Championing a credit culture to create an inclusive economy for all of us to discourage corruption in addition to strengthening the effectiveness and efficiency of our anti-corruption agencies. Our government is committed to delivering improved livelihood and positive economic outcomes which Nigeria can tangibly feel and experience. Our only objective is to create a fairer and safer playing field for all. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, my administration has set eight point priority areas in our agenda. Ending poverty, achieving food security, economic growth and job creation, access to capital across all segments of our society and the economy, inclusivity, security, fairness and rule of law, an anti-corruption crusade to make these priorities possible. We are strengthening the machinery and structure of governance by establishing a public and civil service culture and structure that is performance-driven and result-oriented. We shall govern. 
We shall govern ethically with accountability and transparency. Implementing sound and effective policies to accomplish our eight priorities. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, permit me briefly to talk about some of the policies and programs of our renewed hope agenda and how they fit so well with the theme of this year's summit. We are celebrating 29th. And I pray we'll all be happier when you celebrate 30th. <clears throat> the to stimulate economic growth, we announced the end of a crippling fuel subsidy regime and the unification of foreign exchange rates. Combined with the effect of an unsustainable fiscal deficit, and hidden subsidy. These factors distorted the money supply and created an unfair playing field for an elite crop of our patriotic forces. But that is no more. It's gone. <clears throat> we have tackled these changes at long. That is the hallmark of the leadership that I believe in and that you believe in. The question you asked me that day, will you have the courage to do the following? I answer all of you, yes. Now, my government has introduced Zephra. Measures to resuscitate the economy, including 500 billion naira intervention to support small scale businesses and the agricultural sector. By January 2024, the new student loan program must commence. So the future of our children and students, we are saying no more strikes. There must be consumer credit. The scheme we have to come to effect as soon as possible. I thank my team and my colleagues to build this program. Develop it now. We cannot talk about anti-corruption when you have to look for cash to buy a car. When there's no mortgages for homeowners. Where do you expect a civil servant to have three billion, three million, five million for houses without corruption? If you don't change and plan the welfare of your judiciary. And you ask them to be peer, render justice with mercy, with an hungry stomach. <laughs> New and affordable home will also be built at, all re at a record space, I assure you. We have all felt the pain of this reform. Soon, we shall begin to reap the rewards. It is my hope.
that this summit will deliberate and provide yet more solutions Com to complement the programs mentioned above, to mobilize finance for sustainable development. We have simultaneously commenced an aggressive domestic and external mobilization of financial resources and capital from a wide range of partners among several initiatives we are progressing forward with the development of wide range reforms to our physical and tax policies to ensure an efficient and fair growth friendly physical environment if addis central bank of nigeria about 43 items I've, I've read all the comments nearly but there must be a clear line between monetary policy and physical policy <clears throat> are this item on trade embargo no so you only push them to the parallel market Yeah, let's compete for whatever is available where the government will struggle and work hard to bring more investment into the economy in order to manage the exchange rate. That is my result. <clears throat> to harness our human capital, we must protect the social economically vulnerable and vanquish forever the crippling multidimensional poverty affecting our land. As we move aggressively to end hunger and protect all Nigerian children. Consistent with our commitment to enshrine fairness and the rule of law in our country, this government will help hold the sanctity of every legitimate contract. Specifically, as it relates to foreign exchange obligations of the government, all the forward contracts that the government has entered into will be honored. I believe in the definition of our profession that I inherit the asset and liability of my predecessor. The framework has been put in place to ensure that these obligations are met in due course. My government is not blind to the challenges several of you are facing in the financial markets. I can only allay these concerns by revealing that we have a good line of, of sight for the additional foreign exchange liquidity that is required to restore market confidence. And we are going to do that. <clears throat> Further details elaborating on the specific of this far ranging initiative to deepen foreign exchange liquidity and improve confidence across all stakeholders will be shared by the coordinating minister of economy and the governor central bank of nigeria distinguished ladies and gentlemen a one trillion dollar economy is possible by year 2026 and a three trillion dollar economy is also possible within this decade we can do it with double digit inclusive and sustainable competitive growth this is our agenda i would like to charge you 
the captains of industry here present to commit yourself and redouble your effort to a vision of a renewed hope, more prosperous Nigeria, a better Nigeria for all. For us to successfully deliver our promise to Nigerians, we recon recognize that it is imperative that we foster a high collaborative relationship with private sector. We must work together. We have the proven capacity in this regard. As we remember the role of public-private partnership and the transformation of Lagos State under my leadership, we will replicate that across Nigeria with our unwavering support. Today, I urge you, as Nigeria's foremost private sector think tank and policy advocacy group, to go much further than you have done before. Bring your ideas. Bring your leadership. Be highly inquisitive. And bring your capital. Bring the collective will of your large conglomerates and business networks. Let's build a future of renewed hope. My government is prepared. I hope you are. I hope that is why you are here. I'm confident that by working closely with all of you in the private sector, financing our $3 trillion national infrastructure stock can be achieved in 10 years and not in 300 years. Building mega cities in every geopolitical zones of the size and scale of Lagos must not take us another six decades. We can do it in one decade. A fully networked and connected Nigerian by rail, gas, fiber, digital optics, and road network can be constructed in less than 20 years. Establishing thriving industrial zones in every Nigeria zone is possible before 2030. Let use the next two decades to craft strategies that have relentless backing of our collective will. You have my commitment that my government will act on all the promises and the summit report when it is received from you. Be ready to challenge me after you've crafted those recommendations based upon high intellectual inquisitiveness and workable plans. I'm not standing here to say I'm perfect, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. I will make mistakes as a human being. I'm ready to listen to you. Correct the mistakes and move on. And before looking president, backward is a shadow. The future is calling, and this administration will not hesitate to seize the opportunity of this moment. 
our finest destiny is awaiting us all. Let Nigeria breathe a sigh of renewal hope and confidence. It is within your reach. I've heard it on a number of occasions. And I've read it in several journals. That no one succeeds alone. That is why I'm here. To think with you. That is why the administration is ready to work with you. To chart the path for a greater promising and prosperity rewarding Nigeria. There's various conflicts and contradictions around the world. But we are struggling and working hard to manage the business environment in this country. It is only with you, the collaboration, the effectiveness, the genuineness of your commitment to national growth that, that build us out of depression. I'm therefore pleased to declare this 29th Economic Summit open. Thank you very much. May God bless Nigeria. God bless NASG. God bless all of us and give us the prosperity as we desire. Thank you very much. Your Excellency, Mr. President, you know, those that admire you, sir, and there are millions, you know what they call you? The man of men. Two books around your person describe you effectively. In 2003, there was a book around you, a toast to excellence. And the second book, Jagaban, the profile of an iconic leader. And that's what we are seeing here. Thank you very much, Nigeria. It's actually very, very fortunate to have you, very transformational leader, a change agent, and a political strategist. Let's put our hands together one more time. <laughs> Let me also say thank you to all the sponsors that have made sure this year's 29th edition holds. All of the sponsors, we say thank you to you on behalf of Nigeria Economic Summit Group. Uh, we'll be having a group photograph. Uh, I'll call a few people, and then His Excellency the President will be joining us later. And then after that, the national anthem. And at the departure of the President, we'll all be back here for the first plenary before we have the breakout session. So let me invite here the Attorney General of the Federation and Minister of Justice, the Coordinating Minister of the Economy and Minister of Finance, Minister of Budget and National Planning, uh, the Governor of Kwara State and the Chairman of Nigeria Governors Forum, the SGF, Chairman NSG and Vice,
So let me welcome His Excellency, the President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Are you guys okay? Okay, the national anthem, please. Please will retain our seats. His Excellency the President will be touring the exhibition site, uh, but the rest of us we can remain here. After that, we'll have the first plenary.
increase our investments in all critical aspects of the food value chain in Nigeria. Please. Let's settle down, please. Let's settle down. Let's settle down. Let's settle down, please. Let's settle down, please. Please settle down. Let's take our seats. Former Director General of the Nigerian Economic Committee. It's now time for the ministerial panel, the ministerial dialogue. Well, well, first of all, I, um, I, I'm, I'm very pleased that the President uh, this is attending his first summit since he was elected. Uh, it sends a very strong signal. It, um, it underscores uh, his commitment, I believe, to uh, public-private partnership, and in particular, his uh, commitment to really, you know, harnessing ideas from um, the private sector. And so uh, he did make some um, very uh, important uh, statements, restating his commitment to revitalizing our economy, restating his commitment to fighting corruption, Restating his commitment to improving security in the country. And then, of course, uh, he also spoke about uh, inclusion. He also spoke about uh, expanding our economy massively uh, from f f 450 billion, uh, which is what we have now, to about a trillion, uh, a trillion uh, dollars the next, um, over the next year. And uh, I believe that this is doable, but it's, gonna be, it's only doable with a solid team. It's only doable with a very, uh, with, uh, with a very committed team. Is also uh, doable uh, with um, uh, a president who is required to lead. Uh, sorry, who uh, who who is ready to re lead and who is ready to provide the uh, supervision needed uh, to really get things uh, going. But overall, it was really it was good to have him engage Nigeria's private sector at this level. Let me welcome the following that will be part of the ministerial dialogue, our first plenary. I'd like to welcome here who delivered an amazing um, analysis earlier, the Vice Chair of Nigeria Economic Thank you very much. Let's just settle down, please. Thank you very much. Let's just take our seats.
Let me welcome here now our moderator, Ms. Amina Meina, Vice Chair, Nigeria Economic Summit Group, to step to the stage. That's our moderator. These are members of the panel. Mr. Olawali Edu, Minister of Finance and Coordinating Minister of the Economy. Dr. Doris Uzoka Anite, Minister of Industry, Trade and Investment. Dr. Muhammad Ali Pate, Coordinating Minister of Health and Social Welfare. And Senator Aliu Sabi Abdullahi, Minister of State, Agriculture and Food Security. Let me also invite here the Honorable Minister for Budget and Economic Planning, His Excellency Senator Abubakar Atiku Bagudu. Now we, we have our ministers already seated. We have a video that will introduce the panel or the conversation, and then the moderator will take over. Can we have the video now, please? Navigating economic transformation is a multifaceted endeavor entailing the reshaping of both economic and social frameworks. At this defining moment in Nigeria's 60-year history, the country must adopt a different approach to sustained economic growth and development. A study blueprint accompanied by a viable execution scheme stands as a fundamental requirement to steer the course towards triumph. What are the components pivotal for an effective economic transformation? What will ensure the well-being of the populace? Welcome to the opening plenary of the 29th Nigerian Economic Summit. Plenary 1, an agenda for economic transformation. This plenary is interpreted for a virtual audience in Pigeon, Hausa, Igbo, French and Yoruba. Follow the on-screen instructions to gain access. <sighs> Pathways to Sustainable Economic Transformation and Inclusion. Welcome. This plenary session. Excellencies, your excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, um, thank you. Thank you for coming straight back in, so we can commence the next plenary, which is a ministerial dialogue. On stage with me is the coordinating minister of the economy, 
and the Finance Minister, Mr. Wale Edung. Welcome, sir. We also have the Honorable Minister of Budget and Economic Planning, Mr. Atiku Vagudu, our worker. And we have the Minister of State for, for Agriculture. Oh, welcome, sir. This afternoon, we will be talking about the eight priorities that we have heard Mr. President speak about. And for a start, I will ask each minister on stage to give us um, an opening statement as it concerns your particular role and your ministry in relation to the eight priorities which has been railed out. So, coordinating minister, may I ask you to go first? Thank you. Protocols observe. May I start with a preamble, which I think I'm duty bound to comment on. How long do I have? <laughs> <laughs> Two minutes. <laughs> so I will still just say that 30 years ago, I was here. I was very optimistic, along with some other grey heads here. And those who are not here, Mr. Dotun Suleiman is here, um, along with the likes of the young people then, in the early 30s, who this country did very well by the Atidor Peter sides, the Fola Adeolas, the Gwenga uh, Oyebodis, and so on and so forth. And we're very optimistic. And we heard pretty much what we have heard today. But there's a missing ingredient. Just like for the Spanish football team up till about 2010, when they won the World Cup, there was a missing ingredient. They had everything, the talent, and so on and so forth. I think the missing ingredient for us was a certain type of leadership. And I think you heard earlier today that this may very well be the leader that can bring us all together and take this country forward. I also want to thank the economic summit team, particularly uh, the likes of Ijoma Taylor, Sonyade Ukoli, who determinedly pushed and pushed to make sure that Mr. President was in a position to have enough information to keep his promise. It's not easy delivering a president. I think they did very, very well. I just did my job. I can't imagine being here and I didn't deliver the president and facing you all. So it was a fear of that that propelled me. <laughs> In terms of the economy, the priority areas are there and they all boil down to improving livelihoods, uh, delivering economic outcomes, the human resources aspect, and of course, a fairer um, and more level playing field, particularly for young people to uh, um, express themselves, as we had the opportunity in our days. But the, 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 there are enough brilliant people here that no matter what the conditions, they will excel. In order to, 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 to provide the platform for the priority areas, the first thing that is happening is economic stabilization. Focusing on, first of all, the fiscal side revenues from various sources. The traditional sources, oil, but also taxation and so forth. Then on the monetary side, the governor of Central Bank is not here. Uh, uh, Mr. President is somebody that believes in rule of law and that, that includes um, respecting the autonomy um, um, of the central bank, both in the letter and in the spirit. However, it is one government, and at the end of the day, foreign exchange belongs first and foremost to the federal government, not to the central bank. So I can speak on that. And finally, in terms of stabilization, the other area is getting a hang of the fiscal deficit, making sure that the deficit is reduced, making sure that the deficit is funded in a conventional way. 
and that means dealing with ways and means. Uh, ways and means is uh, essentially outside the law, um, and it is not a sustainable way to be funding um, the federal budget. So those are the areas in which the government has a plan that is coherent and that will provide the basis for investment and growth. Thank you. Please clap. <laughs> so thank you, Honorable Minister. I will come back to you in a, in a minute and ask you to give us maybe some more details with regards to access to capital and the sort of alignment between fiscal and monetary policies for which we will have a breakout session today. But since you spoke about it, talking about the responsibilities, I think it's worth probably elaborating on that a little more for the audience so that people know what to expect in terms of that alignment which you have spoken about, in, particularly as, a, as it relates to respecting the rule of law. But I will come back to you, so I'll give you a minute to chew on that while I take the Minister of Budgets and Economic Planning. And my question to you, Honorable Minister, is we have heard a $1 trillion economy is possible in 2026. To achieve this, we would like to believe that there is a development plan which the government is working with, which is most likely all-encompassing. Um, we would assume that that plan not only talks about the financial responsibility of government, but also the social responsibility of government. So can you tell us a little bit about the plan to get to one trillion in 2026? Thank you, Amina. And Just be yes, yeah. my colleagues and brothers. The, you heard when the president said you inherit both assets and liabilities. One asset that we inherited is the Agenda 2050, which was put together by the private sector, public sector, civil society organizations. And on the back of that Agenda 2050, which is our ambition of where we want to be by 2050, a national development, a series of national development plans were five year each were planned. So the first one is the 2021 to 2025. Of course, uh, after that is the medium term expenditure framework, which is a three year medium term framework that is always provided by the government as well as the one year plan, which is the budget. So the, the first thing is, Mr. President, in the institutional alignment, brought both the one-year planning and this medium and long-term plans in one place. And secondly, these plans were drawn in appreciation of the fact that we are a federation. So there are, and this federation and the, sorry, the ingredient of the federation actually and the planning drive itself from the constitution. We have an organ called the National Economic Council, which is the federating units meeting uh, quite often monthly in order to discuss economic affairs and align planning. Equally, the constitution provided under fundamental objectives of state, the economic objectives that are an irreducible minimum which the nations agrees upon. And in all this, what it shows is that if we recognize our diversity, appreciate it, coordinate it, as contained in a legislation, the National uh, Planning Commission Act 1993 and the current attempt to uh, amend it as a National Planning Act 20, bill, sorry, 2023. The whole idea is to appreciate that 
the sanctity of planning and an irreducible commitment to that implementation of a plan is what will give the private sector comfort that yes, we can put our money, yes, we can think about five years, yes, we can think about 10 years. And I think that is being provided. So the eight point agenda that have been priority areas are consistent with our long-term agenda 2050. And in any case, in consultation with the private sector as part of what is being done today, we will also examine the National Development Plan for 2021 to 2025 to, uh, to ensure that it reflects both the renewed hope agenda the policy advisory committees we set in and our um, national aspiration. What it shows history, our history, history around the world have shown that countries can achieve the kind of growth we are praying, we are hoping for. So it's not new. And I think with the, with the determination that one is seeing around the $1 trillion economy is possible. Thank you. Now, Honorable Minister of State, um, hunger is real. Absolutely. Right. Um, people are struggling to put food on the table, not just in terms of grappling with the reforms which we recognize and appreciate that we must go through to get the nation working again. But food has become a difficult, um, a difficult topic, so to say, across sectors, I mean, across strata, it doesn't matter if you're young, old, middle class, food is a problem. We know that one of the priorities of this administration is food security. What are you doing specifically about food security? Can you tell us in five minutes, please? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, first, let me appreciate the Nigeria Economic Summit Group for bringing us here at this particular point in time. Uh, for us in the Federal Ministry of Agriculture and Food Security, you will recall until now, it used to be called Federal Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development. So the tweaking of the name is to underscore the importance of food security in the Renewed Hope Agenda of President Bola Ahmed Tinubu. And of course, uh, the eight-point agenda in terms of prioritization, food security is key to the functions of the ministry. And of course, we have economic growth and job creation. And we also have poverty eradication and inclusivity. Now, like you rightly said, food is key. And I'm sure from morning to now, most people probably here must have had their breakfast, and if they've not had their breakfast, they will have been thinking of food in the next couple of uh, minutes or hours. So food, food is key. Now, for us in the ministry, the agricultural sector is facing very serious challenges. And I think the first challenge, like we all know, is the fact that we are having low productivity in terms of most of our food security crops. A situation where farmers in some other climes are getting double what our farmers are getting here is something we consider unacceptable. Now, the second challenge is the fact that we have, you know, flooding. The impact of climate change, like we all know, desertification from the north, uh, flooding in the middle, and coastal erosion in the south, uh, which the president aptly put when he attended the UN General Assembly. Now. For us in the ministry, we realize there is serious inflation, food inflation, the cost of food have gone up, perhaps because of the initial shock of the removal of fuel subsidy, a lot are not in place. So what we have done is the next opportunity available to us. The rainy season is almost gone, but the dry season, for which Nigeria has very tremendous you know, potentials on, we decide we have to focus on it. And I'm happy to say that for the dry season program, 
we are starting with wheat, rice, no, uh, yes, rice, and then uh, soya bean and uh, vegetables. That is various uh, tomatoes and all the other leaf vegetables. Now, what we realize is that for the farmer, what are their challenges? Their key challenges usually is the input. And apart from input, sometimes some of the programs we have, when they are not properly targeted, they end up being taken over by what we call briefcase farmers. Uh, immediately, we announced that we are having a you know, dry season program. We've received several proposals from people who never own farm, and we are worried. So that explains why in the ministry we've decided we need to go back to basic. And I think two weeks ago, the Minister of Agriculture, my brother, Senator Aukari, was in Jigawa State. Uh, fortunately, the Jigawa State Governor is here. He's given us very tremendous support for the wheat program. And I think Jigawa State is offering us 40,000 hectares of land. I think it's even more now from the field visit. So what we are doing in the ministry is we realize agriculture is done on the land. So no more paper agriculture, no more computer-dressed agriculture. We want to get down to where the farmers are. And uh, I must say this. The Nigerian farmer is passionate about his farming. They have the willingness to do the farming. They are ready to do the farming. What is the problem? All they need is input that should get to them at the time they need it. And I think somehow we have decided in some of the programs that have happened in the past, we've not really been able to get a situation where we are able to get farmers to get this input when and how they want it. So in the ministry, we are working out a framework that will enable us to have what we call the last mile input delivery system. Uh, the business people are doing last mile delivery, and, and then why can't we do it for the farmers? So I think these are some of the issues we are having. Fertilizer is a quite, you know, is a big issue, but we are also working around that to see what we can do so that farmers can also have access to fertilizer. But the last point I would like to make here is the fact that we want agriculture to be seen as a business. And the only way agriculture can be seen as a business is when government creates that enabling environment. So I know we've had the ease of doing business, and we say, why not ease of doing agriculture in Nigeria also? Why not? What are those things that will make you know, doing agriculture in Nigeria easy for those who want to invest? So we're going to look into all of these things, and I'm sure in the course of the coming months, perhaps members of this very elite group will definitely see us knocking at their doors so that we can get insight into those things that went done by government we ease participation in the agricultural value chain development that this government is seriously planning for. Thank you. You can be sure the private sector will be happy to partner with you. I think that's the reason why we're here. We want to change the structure of our economy. And we are willing, we are able, and we'll be more than happy to um, deliberate further with you through the NESG. Now, I'm coming back to you, Coordinating Minister. Um, I'd mentioned that I would like you to probably talk a little more about the alignment between the fiscal and the monetary policies that we should be expecting. But you are also the coordinating minister of the economy. I'm not sure I envy you because <laughs> given where we are today, those are some very big shoes to carry. Um, because we don't have too much time, I would like you to speak to us, private sector in this room, and tell us specifically one thing that you would like to look back on in 12 months, or maybe when we come for the next summit, which will be our 30th summit, to say this is one thing that government collaborated with private sector on, and we can actually take a view on that. What would you expect from us? We are willing to partner with government, but being the coordinating minister of the economy, that it's very difficult times, tough times, but what we're saying is, as private sector, we're here to help. What is your expectation? 
Thank you very much, uh, Amina. The partnership is very welcome and uh, it's already in progress. Le le let me uh, say that in responding to your question, may I also have permission to deal with the elephant in the room, which effectively is, uh, and I see the governor of Central Bank walks in, and I am sure you'll invite him. I'm sure you'll invite him to the podium. There's a sweet seat for him here. <laughs> in that case, I will interrupt your honorable minister, and I'd like to invite the CBN governor to join us on stage. We are <laughs> So, uh, as I was saying, in terms of, let, let me take it like this, in terms of coordination, um, monetary and fiscal policy. In terms of monetary and fiscal policy, we all know there are consequences uh, uh, for monetary policy. If the governor of Central Bank feels that in, in delivering it on his own mandate within his own terms of reference, he has to increase interest rates, of course, that has an effect on the fiscal side because the government is a borrower, uh, its debt service uh, costs go up and so on and so forth. There is coordination. Uh, uh, in, you know, there are two coordinating roles. There's a coordinating uh, minister of the economy, there's a coordinating minister of social welfare. In our role as a coordinating the economy, we do have a meeting where we sit down with the, major, the core uh, of the economy including the Governor of Central Bank, Minister of Power, Minister of Trade, Minister of Agriculture, uh, um, uh, and so on and so forth. And um, so we meet regularly, we try and make sure that objectives are aligned, we track priorities, and we look at the sequencing of the various um, actions. So, so that coordination is going on. In terms of monetary uh, um, fiscal policy, the 40, 43 items um, that have recently been allowed to, uh, as legitimate and uh, eligible for foreign exchange is really an example of um, the kind of overlapping um, that will not take place under the presidency of President Bola Ahmed Tinubu. A monetary instrument, which is foreign exchange, was used to deliver a fiscal objective, which was to protect domestic um, industry and to encourage local output. Um, that is being rectified. The ban has been lifted, but on the, on the fiscal side, there is a study um, under uh, a very able uh, fiscal policy and tax reform committee led by the very able uh, um, Taiwo Uyedele is one of yours, and um, that's part of the partnership, in fact. So to, re to, to make sure that industries that need to, uh, to be protected are protected, to make sure that industries that actually need it to import are, have tariff regimes which allow them to import and so on and so forth. So that's part of the correction. Um, we are already in partnership with the private sector. Mr. President announced that he had, um, that, that he has taken measures to deal with the illiquidity in the foreign exchange market, which we know is very pro problematic at this time. Um, as I say, uh, the, the governor of central bank is here, but in the coordinating role, I will just give um, some insight as to those measures, which I think you will all be very interested in. Um, the market is illiquid. It's not functioning properly because there is not enough supply of foreign exchange, and there are very, various reasons for that. The solution that Mr. President has put on the table is number one, he has signed an executive order that effectively legally allows, under forbearance, all the cash that is in the domestic economy to legally come into the formal money supply. People will be able to take the cash that they have and put it inside the system. Along with that, there's another executive order that allows the domestic issuance of foreign currency instruments so that they will have an incentive to provide that foreign exchange from whatever source um, into um, income-bearing um, instruments. 
alongside that, there is a, as part of the, uh, a, a wider, um, as part of a wider sort of review, um, there is a revamping of the foreign exchange market such that, and um, the details are, are available, and I, I just don't want to go through it uh, step by step, and I'm sure a frequently asked questions sheet will be put out in due course. The foreign exchange market will be simplified, it will be digitalized, and it will be reformed such that all legal and legitimate transactions will fall within the purview of the authorities and a formal market. Anything outside that will be legal and will be uh, a criminal offense and will be punished. Um, and it will be robustly um, followed up so that if you want to pay school fees, if you want to uh, pay a health um, bill, it will be simplified and you will be able to just provide perhaps an identity such as a BVN, NIN, and you'll do your transaction. It will be formal, but you'll be a price taker. Right now, the tail is wagging the dog. A marginal transaction by you to pay school fees will not now change the foreign exchange rate because that will be determined just like in a stock exchange. You cannot go and buy 1,000 shares in flour mills at the end of the day and then move the rate by 10%, 15%. It doesn't happen like that. A market has rules, regulations, it has price discovery, and it has price setting terms. So the foreign exchange market, whether you are dealing through a bank, whether you are dealing through a bureau de change, whether you are dealing through an app, as we all know, the apps, the technology has taken root and it's a big part of the market. All that will be within the formal market and we expect with that liquidity will come. But in addition, from supply of foreign exchange from NMPC, increased production, reduced expenditure from transactions such as forward sales, from our discussions with sovereign wealth funds that are ready to invest and front load, provide advanced funding alongside that investment, there is a line of sight on $10 billion worth of inflow of foreign exchange in the relatively near future, in weeks rather than months. These measures, taken as a whole and comprehensively, should lead to the flow of foreign exchange. As we know, remittance transactions are now done offshore. They are not coming into the market. I think, um, uh, I hope I've said enough to answer the question, deal with the elephant in the room, and give you the uh, uh, confidence or the, that will begin or rather made statements that will begin to restore the confidence that we need to have the foreign exchange market work efficiently and uh, with a high level of liquidity. Over to the Governor of Central Bank. Thank you. I was going to say that. Thank you, Honorable Minister. So, CBN Governor, would like to welcome you. Thank you. Sorry we have ambushed you to come on stage. Probably not prepared, but I know you're capable, so we will ask you, um, following up on the statement from the coordinating minister, we are private sector, we are worried about foreign exchange, and it is the elephant in the room. In addition to the, I would say the free fall we've seen in the last few weeks, um, we see where our exchange rate is today. And it's a real concern. It's a concern for any business person because we're not able to project, particularly where you have imputes that has to do with foreign exchange or foreign component. And even though we've heard that 
The president told us earlier on today, before he left, that all the fords will be cleared. And he gave an assurance that this administration will honor the liabilities that you met in office, all of them. When can we expect to see this um, backlog cleared? What are you doing specifically as the central bank to, I will not say to protect the Naira because we want a free economy, but using monetary tools, how can you safeguard what we're witnessing today as the central bank? And I suppose going forward will be expecting to see a central bank which may have a different way of operating because this I, I believe is your first outing with private sector. In closing, if you could just tell us what to expect during your tenure as the CBN governor. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, for those of you that ambushed me and put me here today, I've written down your names. The last thing I would want to do is talk about foreign exchange and the foreign exchange market in isolation. If, if I did this, I would be shortchanging the narrative. I would be shortchanging the narrative. And if I could just crave your indulgence to say a few things, and then I will try and address the, the questions you asked. Now, happily, we have a situation where the bleeding with respect to Nigeria's resources have stopped. And I refer specifically to the um, subsidy, to the subsidy. And to, and to be honest, when people say they are concerned, uh, yeah, I get it. But <laughs> frankly, I think that was a time to be concerned. Right now, from what I can see, we are on the path of rebuilding. And that is so important for us on the monetary side. If the fiscal is bleeding, it makes life very difficult for us on the monetary side. So to the extent that that has stopped, yeah. yeah, it's a big deal. It's a big deal. It isn't anything for anybody to take lightly. It isn't. This is something that we've tried to do for successive years and failed. And the result of not doing it, we've all seen. We've all seen it. And now, suddenly, it has stopped. In addition to that, the attempt at um, unification of the foreign exchange market, fine, not by any means perfect, but at least substantial more revenues have come in. So the combination of those two things, in addition to some of the other efforts that are being done on the fiscal side, well, let me not say, they can, they can talk about it for themselves, and maybe some of these things I shouldn't be saying, I don't know. But in any case, commendable. That's all I will say. Commendable. Commendable. And in due course, we will see the outcome. So when people say they are concerned, they are worried, they are this thing, I think the time to do that, quite frankly, has gone. 
It has gone. The time when we're rebuilding is not the time for you to be running anywhere. It's really not. There are more difficult decisions to be made, no question about it. But the two very difficult decisions, painful, they've been taken, and now it is a question of managing things till we get to where we really want to get to. And that where we really want to get to is a place where we have a foreign exchange market that is fit for purpose. A foreign exchange market that works for everybody. A foreign exchange market where you know the rules. A foreign exchange market where there are no policy flip-flops. A foreign exchange market where you can predict. That's the bigger deal. That is what we need to do. If we're going to be able to create an ecosystem that will outsurvive us all and we will go to sleep on, we've got to do some basic things, some of which we are already attempting to do, although it's early days, but we're doing them. For example, for example, uh, and I've just, I've just alluded to something, which is that we do need to have a situation where the rules are clear to all that engage in that business. And we're going to come out with that. We're going to come out with an elegant document that will tell you exactly what the rules are. So, I understand the issues with respect to people feeling a bit some discomfort with the way the market has 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 gone of recently of recent but my my sense is that we will come out with something that is representative of the true market because the market itself over time will adjust to some of these things and I'm happy to be frank, I, and I must share this, that we have had an enormous amount of interest from foreign portfolio investors, foreign stakeholders, who really and truly are interested in continuing to engage with Nigeria. And the reason, of course, is they can see where this is all going to. So I just want to, by conclusion, and I know I've run out of time, but by way of conclusion, I just want to say, yes, absolutely right. You are going to find a central bank that going forward would take its objective of price stability very seriously indeed. Thank you very much, Sibian Governor. So, Coordinating Minister, I'll come back to you. Unfortunately, we're running out of time, and I think we can delve further into most of these issues when we go to the breakout session. But in closing, you have mentioned two executive orders that we expect. Have those executive orders been signed? Where can we find them? Are the details out already? Because you have meant, you've touched on what they represent. Um, and I think the audience will just like to know when to expect those um, executive orders out in public. And once you're done, we'll take a one minute closing statement from each panelist, because we're running out of time. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. The executive orders were signed by Mr. President, I think last uh, Thursday. They'll be processed and gazetted. Um, I've already said what the import of them is. And I must say it is partnership with the private sector that has delivered these solutions. And even the other, um, some of the other solution, solutions that I alluded to as to, uh, um, you know, improving the whole um, ecosystem of the um, foreign exchange markets, as Mr. 
Governor of Central Bank mentioned. It is partnership, it is uh, consultation that has brought forward these solutions. And finally, and you can even take it as my closing statement, that Mr. President's commitment is to work with the private sector. His source of fi financing for growth is the private sector around the world at the World Bank meetings. The emphasis was on dealing with the shocks that have led to low growth and high inflation. The developed world is only interested in fighting inflation. That they see, the central bank see it as their core mandate, interest rates will remain high. It is partnership with the private sector, their money, their ingenuity, their ideas that will be used to propel the Nigerian economy and other developing economies. There is nothing out there for us except private capital. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Minister. May I ask the Honorable Minister of Budget and Economic Planning to give us your closing statements? Thank you once again, Amina. And just having heard from the governor of the Central Bank, especially the bit that to provide certainty and the rules and for the wider economy, we are committed to a plan. We are, going to, we are committed to a budget based on plan so that everyone can be clear and be certain about what the policies are. We are going to generate, either put more money in the budget or generate more investment in the eight priority areas of uh, the government so that we can say with certainty that security will improve agriculture and food security will be enhanced, inclusivity will be achieved by providing access to capital, generating economic growth, and supporting uh, uh, rule of law. The, there is a line of sight. We are very clear and we are confident that with the commitment we are seeing from the private sector and the renewed energy around the government, we are, we are confident to chart that course. 